Hello, my name is David Ewan from the Resurrection Center, and presented in this recording is a summary of the second group of five books in the Bible. Tonight, Wayne LaPointe will be sharing the presentation in class, um, and this recording serves as the notes and a reminder of the conversation. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel are the five books that we'll be talking about. So let's begin with Joshua. Joshua, basically it's about seizing the promised land. So Joshua is Israel's new leader after Moses, and he leads Israel to conquer the promised land, then parcels out the territories to the 12 tribes of Israel. So you may have probably heard of a few fantastic stories from this book, like the Battle of Jericho and the Day the Sun Stood Still, but most of the action happens in the first half of this book. The last half of the the book is pretty much all about divvying up real estate. Okay, So the book of Joshua records the culmination of Israel's journey to the promised land. Here we see God fulfill his promise to give the land of Canaan to Jacob's descendants. Joshua portrays the Lord as their general, the one who would lead his people into victorious battle if they would just trust and obey. Joshua recounts the story of contradiction. On one hand, God gave the land that he had promised to the nation. On the other hand, the people failed to possess the land completely, allowing some inhabitants to remain. God fulfilled his side of the bargain, but the Israelites did not finish the job. The Canaanite peoples became a damaging influence on Israel as the years went by. So let's do an overview of Joshua. So the nation of Israel has followed Moses for 40 years. God has delivered them from slavery in Egypt, disciplined them in the wilderness, and brought them to the land he promised their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now Moses is dead. In his aid, Joshua is commissioned to lead the people into the promised land of Canaan. The book of Joshua can be broken into two simple parts, conquering the land, and then settling the land. The 12 tribes of Israel have been charged with keeping God's commandments, driving out the land's evil inhabitants, and divvying up the land among themselves as an inheritance. Joshua oversees this process, which includes the miraculous crossing of the Jordan. Uh, We'll see that in Joshua 3, and the battle of Jericho in Joshua 6, and the sun and moon standing still in Joshua uh, 10, verse 12 and through 14. Um, the book begins with God calling Joshua to be strong, courageous, and obedient. And we see that in the beginning at, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Joshua is obedient, and the people are faithful to God under Joshua's leadership. The book ends with Joshua's death and the people of Israel happily serving God in the land he has given them. So the theme verse of Joshua, this is the theme verse in Joshua, and it's Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So let's talk about Joshua's role in the Bible. The book of Joshua marks God fulfilling his promise to Abraham that the land of Canaan would belong to his descendants. More than 500 years later, the children of Israel finally settled the land and make it theirs. This book also marks the end of an age for Israel. After Moses and Joshua die, there is no commission leader of the whole nation, save God himself. Israel moves into the age of Judges when God periodically raises leaders to deliver Israel from their enemies. So the basic outline of Joshua is in verses 1 through 12, Joshua and Israel, uh, and Israel conquered the land. Uh, in verse 13 through 24, Joshua d- divides the land among the tribes. Okay, so what's the, the big idea in all of this? The book of Joshua was written to the descendants of those who conquered the land as a historical account of how they would come to settle there. It celebrates God as a general, defender, and king. 
It shows the geographical boundaries given to each tribe of Israel. Even more significantly, the book of Joshua serves as the connecting narrative between the days of Moses and the days of Judges, during which the book was first circulated. That which Moses began and endured in the wilderness, Joshua was able to claim victoriously in the land. God's promise through the ages were being fulfilled before the people's eyes. And in Joshua 21.45, the scripture reads, Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. So that's all I wanted to say about Joshua. Let me go to Judges. Uh, this relates to the cycle of sin and deliverance. That's what Judges is all about. So this is a time when Israel enters a cycle of turning from God falling captive to oppressive nations, calling out to God, and being rescued by leaders God sends their way. They're called judges. That's where the book gets its name. So the period of the judges began after the death of Joshua in the early 14th century B.C. And this is Joshua 24-29, and continued until Saul was crowned king of Israel by the prophet Samuel in 1051 BC, and that we see at 1st of Samuel 1024. So again, I'm going to give you the period of Judges. Again, uh, it began after the death of Joshua in the early 14th century, so that's around Joshua 2429, uh, and continued uh, until Saul was crowned king of Israel by the prophet Samuel, and that was until 1051 BC, and that's uh, seen in First of Samuel 10.24. So again, the range is Joshua 24.29 all the way up through First of Samuel 10.24. So let me give you an overview of Judges. Judges is the account of how Israel behaves between the death of Joshua and the leadership of a king. Instead of remaining loyal to God and following his laws, this generation of Israelites wanders in their faith worshiping idols, indulging in violence, and generally becoming just like the other nations around them. And that's the problem, as Israel was supposed to represent God to the nations. So the book of Judges opens up with sort of a snapshot of political and a spiritual landscape. So the first one is the land is not fully possessed yet, as Israel does not drive out a few pockets of people they were told to eliminate. The second is the military and spiritual leader, Joshua, is dead. So that happened. And the third one, the people began worshiping false god. Okay, and this was introduced uh, by the Canaanites living among them. Okay, so Judges represents various examples of how God deals with this. Uh, with And, and it uh, deals with his people during this time. Uh, uh, or period, I should say. So the, the stories of Judges follows a pattern. And we see this in Judges chapter 2, verse 11 through 23. The first one, Israel turns from God and serves idol. The second one, God turns Israel over to the oppressive surrounding nations. The third one, Israel turns to God and cries out for help. And the fourth one, God raises up a judge to deliver them. Israel rebels. God disciplines, Israel repents, God delivers. That's basically the book. Israel rebels, God disciplines, Israel repents, God delivers. So the theme verse of Judges. This is uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Again, Judges chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter two, verse 14 through 16. And I'll read. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the land of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them. So they were severely distressed. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands who plundered them. And 
now let's talk about judges' role in the Bible. Uh, the period of Judges is a dark era in Israel's history. The book shows how persistent Israel is in forgetting the Lord and how faithful God is to discipline and deliver his people. It's in the book of Judges that we see Israel's need for a Messiah, a godly king, because there is no good king in Israel. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And we see that in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Okay, so the primary message of Judges is that God will not allow sin to go unpublished. As we saw in the book of Exodus, uh, as Exodus established, Israel was God's people. He was their king. They had forsaken the covenant established at Mount Sinai. In Judges, he disciplined them for following other gods, disobeying his sacrificial laws, engaging in blatant immorality, and descending into anarchy at times. Yet, because they were his people, he listened to their cries for mercy and raised up leaders to deliver them. Unfortunately, even these godly individuals did not wield sufficient influence to change the nation's directions. The people's inability to resist sinful Canaanite influences eventually revealed their desire for a centralized monarchy led by the uh, righteous king whom God would choose as his intermediary. We see that later. So that's what I wanted to talk about, Judges. Let's go to the third book I'll talk about today. That's the, thir that's the third book. It's called The Book of Ruth. And The Book of Ruth is a story of redemption and hope for a family and a nation. It's about two widows who lose everything and find hope in Israel, which leads to the birth of the future King David. It's a dark and troubled time for Naomi, a, a f as a famine drives her and her family from their land in Israel, and her husband and sons die in a foreign country. But when she hears that there is food in her homeland again, she makes her way back. One daughter-in-law leaves Naomi to find a new husband. The other swears an oath to loyalty to Naomi. So let me tell you about Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And where I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And again, that's Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. So the events of the book of Ruth occur sometime between 1160 B.C. and 1100 B.C., in a short 60-year period, and during the latter period of the Judges in Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, these were dark days full of suffering brought out about the Israelites, um, and a lot has to do with their immorality. Um, part of the judgments God brought upon his sinful, sinful people included famine and war. The book of Ruth opens up with a report of famine, which drove Naomi's family out of Bethlehem into the neighboring Moab. Uh, Naomi eventually returned with Ruth because she heard that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. And we see that in the book of Ruth. Even though Ruth is a foreigner in the land of Israel, a wealthy farmer named Boaz takes interest in her. Boaz is also related to Naomi, making him eligible to redeem Naomi's family. That is, to purchase her late husband's field and continue in her late husband's bloodline. Boaz is impressed by Ruth's character and marries her. Ruth and Boaz have a son, and the book closes with a surprise. Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David, whom we meet later in the book of First of Samuel. The, the story of uh, Ruth takes place during the time of Judges. It's a bright story of hope during a very dark period in Israel's spiritual, spiritual and political his history, I should say. Um, the book of Ruth showed the Israelites the blessings that obedience could bring. It showed them the loving, faithful nature of their God. Obedience in everyday life pleases God when we reflect his character through our interactions with others. We bring glory to him. Ruth's sacrifices 
and hard work to provide for Naomi's reflected God's love. Boaz's loyalty to his kinsman, Naomi's husband, reflected God's faithfulness. Naomi's plan for Ruth's future reflected selfless love. So the theme verse of Ruth, when the woman said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who had who has not left you without Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. Okay, and that's Ruth chapter 4, verse 14. So let me tell you about Ruth's role in the Bible. The book of Ruth is a love story, but it is far more than a romance. Ruth's devotion to Naomi and Bo's devotion to Ruth provide two compelling portraits of love among the people of God. But the greatest love displayed in this book is God's love for Naomi and all of Israel, okay? So a little bit of a summary. Naomi claims that God has dealt bitterly with her, okay? That's Ruth uh, chapter 1, verse 20. But the story ends with women recognizing God's provision for her. That's Ruth chapter 4, verse 14. Naomi blames God for the loss of her two sons. That's in Ruth chapter 1, verse 21. But the book concludes with Ruth being praised as better than seven sons. That's Ruth in chapter 4, verse 15. So we see a lot of how God is treating this whole situation. So just as Boaz redeemed Naomi, David will go, this is King David in the future, will go on to deliver Israel from her enemies and bring about security for the nation of Israel. Um, so the quick outline of Ruth. Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem. Ruth gleans in Boaz's field. Uh, Ruth proposes to Boaz. Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi, and then we learn about King David's genealogy at the very end. Okay, so that's basically the book of Ruth. That's all I wanted to say about the book of Ruth. Now I will go to first and second of Samuel. I will first talk about first of Samuel. Okay, this is first of Samuel. This is the fourth book that I'm talking about today. Israel demands a king who turns out to be quite a disappointment. Uh oh. So 1 Samuel chronicles the beginning of Israel's monarchy following the lives of the prophet Samuel, the ill-fated king, Saul, and God's ultimate choice of David as king. Several themes are featured uh, in this uh, book. In this critical period of Israel's history, the people of God transformed from a loosely affiliated group of tribes into a unified nation under the, a form of government headed by a king. They traded the turmoil of life under the judges for stability of a strong central monarchy. That's what they needed, a central monarchy. Okay, so first of Samuel focuses on the establishment of that monarchy. The people demanded a king similar to the kings of surrounding nations. First of Samuel 8, 5. First of Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. So Saul, he was the first king. Saul, the first king, uh, was head and shoulders above the rest, did not have a righteous heart. That was the problem with Saul. He did not have a righteous heart. And his line was destined never to inherit the crown. And that was seen in chapter 9, verse 1 through uh, chapter, um, oh, I guess it was uh, from chapter 9, verse 1 through 15, verse 35. So God instructed Samuel to anoint David the youngest son of Jesse of Bethlehem, as the next king. And that is seen in chapter 16, verse 1 through 13. Okay, so what is First of Samuel about? Israel has not heard from God in decades. The priests are corrupt. The nearby nations threaten the land's safety. Even Eli, the high priest and judge of Israel, is not faithfully serving God and the people. Israel needs more than a judge. Israel needs to hear from God again. Israel needs a prophet. So what happens? So God gives them Samuel. That's what it's about. Samuel serves the people as a prophet and judge. He speaks the word of the Lord to the people and teaches them how to live as the people of God. But when Samuel grows old and Israel enemies attack, the people demand that Samuel appoint a king. Samuel advises the people to trust in God and not in human leadership. But the people do not listen. They are determined to have a king rule over them and deliver them from their enemy. So what happens? So God gives them Saul. Saul, unfortunately, is a foolish, selfish, cowardly king. 
Okay? <clears throat> he ignores the word of the Lord and craves the approval of men. He disobeys God several times and oversteps his duties and puts the people at odds with God and each other. King Saul does not keep the law of Moses and does not direct the Israelites to live as God's holy people. So what happens? So God gives them David. David is a man after God's own heart. And we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. He's a skilled warrior, a musician, and a leader of men, a man who trusts in God and encourages his countrymen to act like God's people. David's famous defeat of Goliath makes him a popular famous figure in Israel. Saul fears that David will seize his kingdom eventually and spends the rest of his life hunting David down. So the main theme verse of the first of Samuel, this is the first of Samuel, um, and I'll be reading first of Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 through 25. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. That's the main theme first of the first of Samuel. Um, and I was reading chapter 12, verse 24 through 25. So let's talk about the first of Samuel's role in the Bible. Okay. So the first of Samuel marks a great turning point in Israel's history. Israel transitions from um, a theocracy to monarchy. Uh, instead of crying to God for help, which worked before, that was in uh, judges, um, Israel demands that Samuel appoints a king. At first, they were saddled with the ungodly Saul, but God raises up another to deliver and lead his people. It is in First of Samuel that we see an example of um, of a Messiah, sort of a God anointed royalty. And Saul and David are anointed by God to lead and deliver Israel. Jesus, a descendant of David, is the true Messiah anointed by God to rule over all and save the lost. Okay, and that's later. Um, the books of First and Second of Samuel are really one story. God finds a man after his own heart, that's King of David, uh, King David, I should say, uh, to lead his people. Um, these two books were not originally divided, and so the Second of Samuel begins with David hearing the news of Saul's death. Okay, so the outline of, of Samuel... Uh, a first of Samuel, I should say. God raises up Samuel as a prophet and judge. Then Israel demands a king. That's King Saul. God raises up David to be king of Israel. Then Saul hunts David out of jealousy. Okay. Now let's now go to the second uh, of Samuel. This is second of Samuel. And second of Samuel shows how King David reigns. Okay, so the book of the second of Samuel, it is set in the land of Israel during the reign of David and follows the course of his 40 years uh, as king of Israel. Okay, so that's from 1011 uh, to 971 BC. That's the approximate timeline. Again, it's 1011 to 971 BC. First Samuel, the, the book of first of Samuel, that introduces the monarchy of Israel and the second of Samuel chronicles the establishment of the king of David, that dynasty, and the expansion of Israel under God's chosen leader. Okay, so the the book of the second of Samuel opens as King David, or David, I should say, learns of Saul's death. So the first 10 chapters show David as a as victorious in battle, praised by the peoples, uh, compassionate to the sick and poor, and righteous in God's sight. We see David dance before the Lord in the streets of Jerusalem as his men brought the, the Ark of the Covenant back home. Despite the turmoil in his later years, David enjoyed the Lord's forgiveness and favor. His genuine sorrow and regret over his sins revealed his repentant heart with which the Lord was pleased. David celebrates God's faithfulness in Psalms 89, penning these words inspired by God. And I'm going to read Psalm 89, verse 34 through 7, uh, 37. Again, that's Psalm chapter 89, verse 34 through 37. My covenant I will not violate, 
nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. Okay? So King Saul and the prophet Samuel are dead. But God has not left Israel without a leader. David, the boy who killed Goliath, is famous and a mighty warrior in Israel and the man God has chosen as Israel's new king. David is a good king who serves the Lord and cares for his people. God blesses David and the entire nation under his rule. More importantly, God makes a covenant, a solemn agreement, with David promising to establish his throne forever. However, David disobeys the Lord and sleeps with Bathsheba, who is married to one of David's soldiers. David repents, but God punishes him with wars, betrayal, rebellions, and national upheaval. David still serves God throughout these difficulties, though, and God is faithful to his promise. David remains king over Israel. Okay, so the theme verse of the second of Samuel, Now, O Lord, you are God, and your words are truth, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. And again, that's in second of Samuel. And that is in chapter 7, verse 28. So I was reading second of Samuel, chapter 7, verse 28. So let's talk about the role in the Bible of the book of second of Samuel. This is the second of Samuel's role in the Bible. So, whereas the book of the, of first Samuel, first of Samuel, shows Israel's transition from God's authority to Saul's irresponsible rule, second of Samuel documents the transition back to God honoring leadership under King David. Okay? So, King David was anointed king of Israel by God and is a picture of the true Messiah. This is God's anointed one. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed to be the fulfillment of a godly king. While David seeks to uphold the law of Moses, but Christ comes to fulfill the law. David is tempted and fails, but Jesus overcame temptation. God promises that David's bloodline will have an everlasting kingdom, and Christ will rule over the Israel forever. And we see that in Luke chapter 1, verse 32 through 33. So, um, David is known as a man after God's own heart. We know that through First of Samuel, chapter 13 through 14, because though he sinned greatly and made mistakes, he acknowledged those failures and repented before God. Repent means to turn away from sin, a, a change of thinking, and to turn towards righteousness. Our Father knows we are not perfect, so his Son, Jesus Christ, paid the price for our sins so that we can become righteous in God's sight through faith. And although our salvation is secure, our daily sins can be can hinder our relationship with God. When we confess our sins, turning to the Lord in humility, he will forgive us and restore our relationship with him. And this is what King David had seen, Okay. So the basic outline of the second of Samuel, uh, King David becomes the king of Israel. Next, God establishes David's kingdom. Then David sins with Bathsheba. David's son uh, Absalom leads an uprising and David wages war. Okay, so that's the basic uh, outline. So that is what I wanted to tell you about uh, the second five books in the Bible. Today we talked about Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st of Samuel, and 2nd of Samuel. Later, uh, Wayne LaPointe will be giving a class, uh, but this recording will serve as the notes and the summary of the five books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st of Samuel, and 2nd of Samuel. My name is David Ewan, and this is The Resurrection Center.